Let's pray as we get ready for the word. Father, we praise you. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this day. We thank you for this gathering on such a critical day as today. You have called us, you have led your people to make this happen, that we would be today in the capital city at this time, in this place, for your purposes, for your prophetic purposes, Father. And I ask that you deliver a prophetic word. I ask in my weakness, my great weakness, be strong in your strength, touch your people, and let the word do what you have purpose to accomplish with it. And we praise you, thank you, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the King of Kings. And we say, Amen. Amen. Members of the Presidential Inaugural Breakfast Committee and members of Congress who have been here, senators, representatives, ambassadors, and delegates from other nations who are here, ministers and people of God and friends and media, we're gathered here in Washington, D.C., America's capital city, on January 21st, 2013, the morning of the presidential inauguration with one agenda and one purpose, to come before the Lord and in his presence, to seek his face and pray for his blessing, his will, and his purposes for its president, its government, this nation, and its people. It is fitting that we do it this day which more than any other represents the future of America. We're here to inaugurate God's own purposes. We've come here from every part of this land and from every background and persuasion to stand before the Almighty, who transcends politics, movements, and men, and before whom kings and kingdoms rise and fall. Presidents change, political parties come and go, nations ascend and descend before him who changes not, but he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. We come before him, before whom men and women, kings and prophets, peoples and nations have come from ages past, come before him to seek his face in troubled times. We come to pray for America. But how do we do that? How do we pray for this nation? Do we pray for riches, for power, for the success of national agendas? The scriptures tell us that God hears the prayers of his people, but we must pray according to his will. If a man has a terminal disease, we don't pray for an increase in wealth, we pray for healing. If a city lies in danger of destruction, we don't pray with flowery words, we sound the alarm. We pray for blessing, but true blessing only comes in the will of God. So the truth must be spoken as well. We must pray according to the truth, and we must not be afraid to speak the truth. We must give voice to what must be spoken. We must sound the alarm that must be sounded. We must address what must be addressed. And so the, mes the message now will not be politically correct, nor will it be political. It will be biblical. It will be true. And wherever it falls, let it fall. I will not hold back, and if I offend you, I apologize that I cannot apologize for offending you. <laughs> Without truth, there is no love. On a day that so embodies the future course of this nation, it's critical that we both pray and speak the truth. In ancient times, there was a nation known as the Kingdom of Israel that had been founded on God's Word, dedicated to His will, consecrated to his purposes, and God blessed it with prosperity, power, security, peace, and a place at the head of nations. But the people of Israel made a fatal mistake. In the midst of their blessings, they turned away from their God. They began to remove him from their lives. Step by step, they ruled him out of their culture, out of their government, out of their economy, out of the public square, out of the instruction and lives of their children. They ruled him out of the kingdom. They would still at times invoke his name, but increasingly it rang hollow and meaningless. They had made themselves strangers to the God of their fathers and their foundation. And as God was driven from their lives, they brought in foreign gods and idols to replace him, gods of sensuality, materialism, violence, idols of wealth and carnality, sexual promiscuity. They abandoned the ways of God, the laws, the standards of God, and for immorality. As the prophets cried out to them, they now called evil good and good evil. What they once knew to be immoral, they now celebrated. 
What they once knew to be right, they now warred against. It was a culture turned in upon itself. It was a civilization at war against the very foundation on which it had been established. And the righteous who simply remained true to what they had always known to be true were now vilified, mocked, marginalized, labeled as intolerant, increasingly banned from the public square, and ultimately persecuted. The nation's culture grew increasingly vulgar, godless, and, and darkened. They now ridiculed, mocked, and blasphemed the name of God. It was as if a spiritual amnesia had overtaken the kingdom, as if they had never known God or his ways. And they descended into the darkest of sins of nations that surrounded them. They offered up their children as sacrifices to the gods on the altars and the fires of Baal and Molech. And they now stood under the shadow of judgment and in danger of destruction. And God called out to them to return, come back, be saved from destruction. He sent to them seers and prophets to wake them up, call them back, but they wouldn't listen. They mocked the prophets, they persecuted them, and they hardened their hearts, and finally something happened that brought them into the first stage of judgment. But there was another nation or another civilization that was likewise founded on God's word, dedicated to his will and consecrated to his purposes, and from its very exception, America. Those who came to these shores centuries ago to found a new civilization did so by dedicating it to God, committing it for his purposes and glory from the beginning. America was to be a city on a hill, a civilization to which others would look. It was to be a holy commonwealth. And so they modeled it after Israel of the Bible. They brought forth its first governments in the name of Jesus and for the glory of God. They established its first school system for the purpose and teaching of the word of God. They foretold that inasmuch as America would follow the ways of God, God would bless it. In fact, that it would become the most powerful, the most prosperous, the most blessed nation on earth, the head of nations. And it would all come true. America would become the most blessed nation on earth, a refuge for the world's exiles, a light for the world's oppressed, a beacon against the dark forces of tyranny that threatened to engulf the world. America was blessed with prosperity, with peace, power, security, and a place at the head of nations. America has been blessed as no nation in the history of this planet has ever been blessed. Amen. But, Something happened to the city on the hill. As the people of ancient Israel, in the midst of their blessings, committed a fatal error, so have we. We too have as a nation turned from God. We too have removed him as a nation from our lives. Step by step, we too have ruled him out of our culture, out of our government, out of our economy. We too have ruled him out of the instruction and lives of our children. We, too, have made God a stranger. And though we still at times invoke his name as a nation, it becomes increasingly hollow and meaningless. We have made ourselves strangers to God. And as we've driven God from our national life, we have brought in other gods and idols to replace them, gods of sensuality, violence, wealth, carnality, sexual promiscuity. And as did Israel, so too we've abandoned the ways of God and the laws of God for immorality. The nation that was established to bring the word and light of God to the world now fills the earth with pornography. We too now call evil good and good evil. And what we once knew to be immoral, we now celebrate. And what we once knew to be right, we now war against. American culture has also become a culture turned in upon itself, a civilization at war against its own foundations. And those who simply remain true to what has always been known to be true are now vilified, mocked, labeled intolerant, increasingly banned from the public square, and ultimately persecuted. We've now reached the point this day that a minister was driven out of the public square, banned from praying, at the inaugural, for the simple reason that years ago he had preached a sermon, simply saying what the Bible clearly has always said is sin. It is a new America, 
in which one can be banned for the public square simply for believing the Bible, where profanity is treated as holy and the holy is profaned. A new America where the Bible is treated as contraband and nativity scenes are seen as dangerous. Our culture has grown increasingly godless, vulgar, darkened. We now, too, ridicule, mock, and blaspheme the name of God. It wasn't that long ago that American television closed its broadcasting day with sermons about the Lord. Now our televisions and computer screens are filled with words and images once unimaginable, and God and Jesus have now become objects of comedy and mockery. It's as if a spiritual amnesia has overtaken America, and the Lord asked Israel, can a nation forget its God? And yet Israel forgot, and now we too have forgotten. America has forgotten her God. And we too as a nation have partaken in the darkest of sins. Tomorrow is also a milestone of history. Tomorrow marks the 40th anniversary of the day that America legalized the killing of its unborn children. 40 years tomorrow. Israel offered up thousands of its children America has offered up millions. 50 million souls are not here today. 50 million people will not be here watching or cheering at the inauguration. They're silent, for their lives were legislated out of existence, even from this city. And in order to hide the magnitude of our moral descent, we redefine words and change their meanings on this and other sins. And yet a thousand apostate ministers swearing on a thousand Bibles will not change a jot or tittle of the Word of God. Amen. Though silent, they cry out in bearing witness to the darkest of our sins, and God hears them. And as he spoke through the ancient prophets to Israel, so his words now echo down to us. When you lift up your hands to me in prayer, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. The city on the hill has grown darkened. Its lamp has grown dim. Its glory is fading, for God is not mocked. No nation can war against the very source of its blessings and expect its blessings to remain. And as it was with ancient Israel, the city on the hill now stands under the shadow of judgment. How does judgment come to a nation? After defying all of God's calls and warnings, the nation of Israel would experience something unprecedented. It was the opening stage of national judgment. God removed one of Israel's blessings. Years before the nation's destruction, he allowed its hedge of protection to be lifted up. He allowed an enemy to make a strike on the land. It was a wake-up call to avert national destruction, to wake them up. Nothing else would reach them. The strike was limited and temporary. The nation was now given a period of time to turn back to God or enter into judgment. The first opening biblical sign of national judgment is this, the initial removal of the nation's hedge of protection. So it comes to pass. In America, on September 11, 2001, its hedge of protection was lifted. An enemy was allowed to make a strike on the land. It was temporary and contained. It was a wake-up call. We all sensed it, even if we didn't say it. And for a short time, it looked as if America would wake up as if they were, we were on the verge of a national revival. People flocked to churches and spoke of God. And then a few weeks later, it was all over. There was no revival. There was no change, of course, because without repentance, there was no revival. America continues down its spiritual descent, but now it did so with even more fervor. 11 years now after 9-11, the nation stands not closer to God, but much farther away. As I saw the smoke rising from New York City on that day, and then I stood at the corner of Ground Zero, a revelation began coming to me. The revelation would take the form of a book called The Harbinger. The Harbinger was released last year, and from the first week, it became a bestseller spreading across the nation, and now even it's reaching into Capitol Hill. The revelation of The Harbinger is this. There exists an ancient mystery that lies behind everything from 9-11 to the collapse of the American economy. A mystery so precise 
that it actually reveals the actions of American leaders before they take them, the exact words of American leaders before they speak them, a mystery so exact that it gives the actual dates, even the hours of some of the most dramatic days in recent history. In the last days of ancient Israel, before its destruction, nine harbingers, nine prophetic signs of national judgment appeared in the land. Those same nine harbingers are now reappearing on American soil. Some have appeared in New York City. Some have appeared here in Washington, D.C. Some have involved the highest leaders of the land, even the president. They've touched every realm, political, economic, cultural, spiritual, affect every American and every American's future. The harbingers are revealed through an ancient scripture, the vow that Israel made after that first strike of warning. It appears in Isaiah 9:10. Instead of repentance, they responded to God's warning with defiance. They said this, the bricks are falling down, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. What they were saying is this, God, you won't humble us. You won't, you won't cause us to return. We're going to continue down our course. We will continue to abandon your ways. We'll defy you. And even more than before, we will do so by our own efforts. We'll rebuild and we'll come back stronger than before. This vow of defiance would seal their fate, usher in their destruction. And it's the key to the nine harbingers. We don't have the time here to even begin to open up the mysteries of the harbingers, except to say that they are all manifesting to America. And just to touch quickly on a few. The fifth harbinger is in the book is the stone of judgment. For this to manifest, a particular kind of stone must be chiseled out of mountain rock and placed on the ground of destruction where the strike occurred. Three years after 9-11, this stone of judgment appeared and was lowered in the pavement on the pavement of ground zero. A ceremony took place around it. American leaders proclaimed vows of defiance over the stone. The sixth harbinger, the sign of the sycamore, a biblical warning of national judgment. For this to manifest, a sycamore must be struck down in the ground of destruction in the last moments of 9-11. The last tower came down, crashing down. It sent forth a shockwave and a beam, and it struck an object. The object was a tree. The tree was the sycamore. The biblical sign of national judgment, the sycamore, is fallen. The seventh harbinger in Hebrew is called the Erez. The sign of judgment, this one appeared in the sky at the corner of ground zero two years after the calamity. The ninth harbinger is the vow of judgment. The vow of bricks and sycamores, Isaiah 9:10. The very, in the very utterance, its very utterance in the last days of ancient Israel would lead to the nation's destruction. For this harbinger to manifest, an American leader would have to proclaim the vow and from the capital city proclaim a vow of judgment and it would be linked it would have to be linked to 9-11 if you see this happen know that it is stunningly clear that your nation is in danger of judgment on the day after 9-11 the united states congress gathered at capitol hill hill not far from here and they gather there the place where where the inauguration will happen today to give America's response to the calamity, just as ancient Israel had presented its response to the calamity in Isaiah 9:10, The man appointed to speak for the nation was the Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle. He makes his way to the podium and presents the nation's response. At the end of his speech, the words of the ancient vow that bring national judgment came forth out of his mouth. He says this, there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this, he says, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. Then he speaks of the tree that is struck down. He speaks it without even realizing there is an actual tree at ground zero that's just being discovered that day. He speaks of the stone of judgment that will go up. It will come to pass three years later. He has no idea what he's doing, but the vow of judgment is pronounced. Israel's fatal vow becomes America's and is recorded in the annals of Congress. It is ominous. It will set the nation's course. It will lead to the next national shaking that will not involve buildings, but will be the implosion of the American economy itself. The collapse of America's economy that still affects everyone to this day. In the Harbinger, it's called the second shaking. And behind this second shaking, this economic implosion, lies a stream of ancient biblical mysteries. We don't have time to speak of these now except to mention one mind-boggling reality. There was a day given in the Bible called on the Hebrew calendar, the 29th day of Elul, 
Once every seven years on that date at Rule 29, the nation's financial accounts were wiped away. All accounts of credit and debt wiped away. It was originally meant to be a blessing, but as the nation had driven God out of its life and pursued idols and wealth, a sign, it became a sign that was condemning the, their, their rejection of God and that struck the financial realm. The peak of the collapse of the American economy took place at the end of September 2008. On that day, the stock market crashed 777 points. The greatest crash in Wall Street in American history. When did it happen? The greatest collapse in Wall Street history took place on the 29th day of Elul, the exact day given the Bible to strike a nation's financial realm that has driven God out of its life. And the same exact day, the same exact hours. But Elul 29 is part of a seven-year mystery. What happens if we go back seven years from the greatest crash in American history? It takes us to September 2001, the month of 9-11. But something else happened that month. The other greatest stock market crash in American history to that date. When did that take place? The other greatest stock market crash in America took place on the exact same biblical day appointed to strike a nation's financial realm that is under judgment. The two greatest collapses in American history up to those dates both happened on the exact same biblical day and exactly seven years apart to the biblical day and hours. And there's a prophetic mystery here. Behind everything we're seeing, God is alive. There is a prophetic warning in this, and that is, if America does not return to God, it's prosperity, and we will see the end of the prosperity and the end of the American age as we know it. Since the harbinger was released, that which was foreshadowed in its pages is actually coming true. The harbingers of the mysteries haven't stopped. Can, they're continuing to manifest. In fact, one of them took place this year, involved the president who was about to be inaugurated at Ground Zero this year. And one of the mysteries of the Harbinger is something called the Mystery Ground. It actually involves this day, the inauguration, or rather the first inauguration of which this day is the continuation. It was the day that America, as we know it, it's part of the mystery why we're here. It was the day that America, as we know it, came into existence. April 30th, 1789, it was the day the nation's first president was sworn into office, the inauguration of George Washington. Washington placed his hand on the Bible, and then he gave the first ever presidential address. And in that speech, on America's first day, as a fully formed nation, is embedded a prophetic warning to the nation. Washington said this. He said, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. What was he saying? He was saying America's blessings are based on its relationship with God. If America ever disregards or forgets or turns away from the eternal rules of order and right, the laws, the precepts, the standards, the ways of God, if America ever departs from these, then the blessings of God will be withdrawn from the land. This is the prophetic warning embedded in our national foundation, and it is coming true in our day. We are now witnessing America increasingly disregarding the eternal rules of order and right which God has ordained. And the warning is that if we do so, the smiles of heaven, the blessings of God will be withdrawn. When judgment came to Israel, the destruction returned to the same ground where the nation had been dedicated to God, the Temple Mount. The calamity returns to the nation's ground of consecration, dedication. After Washington gave that prophetic warning, he and the nation's first Senate and House of Representatives all proceeded on foot from Federal Hall, the place of the inauguration, to a site especially chosen for the nation's first government to pray and dedicate America's future to God. And that's what they did on that first inauguration on America's first day as a formed nation. They prayed and committed the nation's future to God. That was the nation's consecration ground. If we can find out where that ground is, we will have a mystery. Where did it take place? It happened in the nation's capital. But the capital then was not Washington, D.C. It was New York City. Where? The place where they dedicated America to God on its first day as a nation. America's consecration ground is ground zero. 
America was dedicated to God at ground zero. The ancient mystery, the calamity returns to the nation's ground of consecration. And it was on that ground that the harbingers appeared. It was in the soil of America's consecration that that sycamore grew and was struck down. It was there that it all happened. And on 9-11, a shockwave went forth from ground zero and struck an object. It struck Federal Hall, the very place where Washington was sworn in and where he gave that prophetic warning of what would happen if America ever turned away from God. And it struck the foundation of America and put a crack in the very foundation of Federal Hall. But all around Ground Zero, every building was ruined or destroyed, except one. Which one? It was the little stone chapel inside of which they dedicated America's future to God. And why was it protected? It was protected because there was an object outside the chapel which absorbed the full force of the calamity. The object was the harbinger, the sycamore. You see, the purpose of the harbingers is not to consign a nation to judgment but to awaken it to redemption. It's a message of return. The voice of God is calling this nation to return in prayer, in humility, in repentance, and in hope. And here we stand today on the 21st day of January 2013 in the capital city on the same day, the continuation of that first inaugural day. And on that first inaugural day, they gathered together in prayer and consecrated America's future to God. And here we now are, who are of that future for which they prayed, and we are now gathered together in the prayer gathering of that day before the Almighty. And we stand here centuries later in witness to God's hand of faithfulness and blessing on this land. But we stand here also in witness to the fact that America has done exactly that of which the, 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 we were warned that first day by Washington never to do. We bear witness that we have turned from his eternal ways and the order of right. We have turned and are rapidly turning as a nation away from his face. We all know it. And that is why it is so crucial that we have gathered here today, in this place and on this day, for very shortly, the president will place his hand on an object. He will place his hand on the Bible. And we say, and we appeal, and we say, Mr. President, we've come here to pray for America, for its government, for you, its leader, and for its future. We pray for your blessing and for your prosperity in the will of God. Because only in the will of God can we ever know true blessing. The answer is not found in the agendas of man or political parties, but the answer is found upon that object upon which your hand will rest, upon the word of God. For everything else will pass away, but the word of God will abide forever. So it must be asked, in respect, can you lay your left hand upon his word, the word of God, and then with your right hand enact any law that would go against it? Can you invoke the name of God to assume the presidency and then in any way endorse anything which clearly wars against the ways of God that you invoke? Can you stand in the city named after our first president and perform the act that he first performed on that first day and ignore the warning he gave that day to this nation? Can you do all that and disregard the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. Can we utter the words, so help me God, if you should in any way take part in leading a nation farther from God that you invoke to help. We pray for your blessing in the will of God. For if a nation that once knew the Almighty is called to return to him, then so too must the one who leads it. You will hold in your hand the Bible of Abraham Lincoln. But do you not know what Lincoln said and did? In the midst of the darkness that engulfed this land once before, the darkness he saw as the righteous judgment of God, Lincoln issued a call to the nation. He said this, It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins, and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with the assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. 
and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And in so much as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisement in this world, may we not justly fear that this awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but punishment inflicted upon, it, upon us for our own presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. So Lincoln sent forth this call to America to repent, to return to God, to seek his mercy. And soon after that call went forth, the tide of war began to turn and would ultimately lead to national healing. The words of Abraham Lincoln ring out to us today that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. Amen. Has this nation grown so far from God that we cannot even imagine a president doing so today? Mr. President, if you seek, if you look to Lincoln as your model, then dare to follow him in his actions. For all the politics and all the parties and all the inaugural balls and all the voices of political correctness and all the, all the sounds of applause will grow silent and still. And we will be left, each of us, all of us, to stand before the Almighty. And it will not matter then how many votes we won or how much praise we garnered, only that we were faithful to him and faithful to his word. The voice of Lincoln now cries out to us and pleads with us, let us humble ourselves, confess our national sins, and pray for forgiveness. As it is written and promised in the word of God, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. <laughs> We have come here on the 21st day of January 2013 to the capital city on the day of the presidential inauguration for that purpose, to humble ourselves and pray and to seek his face and to turn from our evil ways. The time is late, the hour is critical, a great nation proceeds in rapid spiritual descent, and these, the signs of warning and judgment are manifesting in this land. The shadow of judgment is upon us, and for those who would ask how in light of judgment can one be saved or safe, we give the answer. The word in Hebrew for safety and salvation is Yeshua. Yeshua is the name which we know in English as Jesus. Outside of him there is no safety, but inside of him there is no fear. It was for him, it was for him and in his name that this nation, this civilization, this city on the hill named America came into existence. And it's only in him and in his name that its problems can ultimately be answered. He remains the answer, the light, in the darkness, the hope when all other hopes are faded and gone. And to all who come, he will receive and he calls out, come. For all you who hear this message and you dwell in darkness, it's time to come and you will not be turned away. And for all you who know him, you his people, it's time to put away any shade of darkness and compromise and take up the mantle of your calling. It's time to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world you are called to be in truth, in power, in love. It's time to light up the darkness. It's time to be strong. It's time to be bold. It's time to be radical. The watchman is crying out. The trumpets are sounding. The voice of the Lord is calling to this nation, saying, Return!
return, return. Let the word go forth. Let the power of God be seen in this land. Let revival burst forth like a mighty river. The voice is calling. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his path. Let every mountain and hill be cast down and every valley be lifted up. And then let the crooked way become straight. Let the rough way become smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Kumi yori ki Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen on you in the name above every name Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the light of the world, the hope of America, the light of the tribe of Judah and the glory of his people Israel. Amen and amen and amen to him be the glory. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Shout to the Lord! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! You are God! You are awesome! You are the King of this land! 